Good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living Sunday morning service. We are so grateful to have our few people here that we are having live in the house and we're very happy to have the live people at home as well. <laughs> Came out really wrong. So anyway, <laughs> let me go ahead and just pass it over to Lonnie before I say something else. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be fun today. <laughs> Well, welcome. I hope that everyone who is joining us on the live stream and on YouTube, that you're hydrating and that you're on fire for the center. So I know I'm feeling like I'm on fire, but um, anyway, it's going to be a glorious morning. It's always already been fun and exciting. So just settle in because we got nothing better to do, right? But be together on Sunday. There you go. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Lonnie. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, let's see, so um, Linda, do you want to start with um, talking about your class that you're going to do? Be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. In 2008, I needed a renewal. My business in the recession was in the tanks. So when the our center offered a course in prosperity, keys to the kingdom, I signed up first. It's a fabulous seven-week journey to renew your mind, transform your thinking into prosperity in many areas of your life, your health, your finances, your career, or your creative intentions. It took the seven weeks to transform my mind. I, because when you take the course here at the center, you also get the recording of the author that goes along with a workbook. So every year in September, every year in January, <laughs> I start the year with this seven week process and it sets the intention for prosperity in all areas of my life, transforms my thinking. It's starting August the 25th on Zoom at 6.30, it'll be an hour and a half class. Come join us, and if you have any challenges, get in touch with me about technology or how it all will work. Thank you. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Our flower arrangement today is dedicated to Doreen Palermo because she is so committed and she was tenacious in bringing back the one-minute miracles after church. And this is great news for all of us because this is a perfect time for prayer, especially after hearing a sermon or what have you. You know, you just, you're, you're finished with the sermon. Maybe some things came up with you or finished with the service rather. And it's a great time to speak with a practitioner and kind of get clearer about what is yours to do. How do you internalize that message and how do you apply it to your life so that you can have the fantastic, great life that you deserve? So uh, towards the end of the, the service, uh, Annette will post the Zoom link and you can have a Zoom private practitioner session right after the service from 11 to 11.20. Doreen was responsible for that and that is why we were giving here these beautiful flowers. So at home, let us give a big round of applause for <laughs> Doreen. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. So I think that's it for now. Uh, let us go ahead and have Linda come up and she will pray us in. So if practitioners, if you would stand, even if you're at home, and everybody just take a deep breath, center in to the now, to the beautiful now of being with this loving community. And I know that for everyone here present, and everyone seeing and hearing this service, that God is with you, is around you, and is moving through your every thought and action. And I am so knowing that as we each connect with our co-creator, with the divine, with spirit, whatever term you want to use, that our lives are enriched in all ways, in every moment that we remember that connection. And I know that as our service unfolds, the words, the music, 
all of the people that are praying for our community. I know that as Reverend Bonnie brings us her message, we're inspired, we're transformed in our mind, our hearts, and our souls. And that the music inspires us, that we are touched in a place that allows us to have a wonderful, peaceful experience as we experience this service. And as we go about during the rest of our week, we take that peace, that love, that community with us in our heart and our mind and our soul. It's all possible. And I'm so thankful for this community, for each person who's watching, hearing our service, each person that's here in the sanctuary to serve this community. I'm just so thankful to be a part of it and to have this teaching as my lean in during all these crazy times. And as I speak my words, I release them into divine law, into God's loving arms, and I know that all is well. And together we say, and so it is. So let us continue to breathe deeply to be still, to anchor in that presence as we open our hearts to go even deeper with the words of our sacred reading. An excerpt from A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. One of the most basic mind structures through which the ego comes into existence is identification. The word identification is derived from the Latin word idem, meaning same, and facere, which means to make. So when I identify with something, I make it the same. <clears throat> the same as what? The same as I. I endow it with a sense of self. And so it becomes part of my identity. We identify with forms, things like thoughts, the body, our emotions, things, opinions, need, and so much more. When forms that you had identified with that gave you your sense of self collapse or are taken away, it can lead to a collapse of the ego, since ego is identification with form. When there is nothing to identify with anymore, who are you? When forms around you die or death approaches, your sense of beingness, of I am, is freed from its entanglement with form. Spirit is released from its imprisonment in matter. You realize your essential identity as formless, as an all-pervasive presence of being prior to all forms, all identifications. You realize your true identity as consciousness itself, rather than that what consciousness had identified with. That's the peace of God. The ultimate truth of who you are is not I am this or I am that, but simply I am. Opening our eyes in love and in service to what is, as it is, and so it is. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm so happy, thrilled indeed to be with you this morning. And I don't say that uh, meaninglessly. It's not just a flippant phrase. I really am thrilled to be here. Inside, I'm hopping up and down like crazy. And I'm grateful to be able to play with Chris this morning. He's, he's awesome. He's a wonderful, wonderful musician. I was, you don't know this, man. I was, just, I was just telling Laura, you're such a beautiful piano player. It's just so easy and just gorgeous. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. So um, the song we're presenting this morning is called The Least of These. Yeshua uh, was um, uh, quoted as saying, 
in essence, before you judge someone else, you know, watch it. In other words, before you go trying to pull that little sliver of wood out of someone else's eye, remove the whole log that's in your own. This song speaks of such themes, very important in this day, the least of these. got something on my mind and it's high time for my confession to the world I may seem kind a success in my profession but when I search deep in my soul I find a hole about the size of your oppression so I wonder, I wonder, could it be the solution is calling for me? Whatever I've done to the least, whatever I've done to the least, whatever I've done to the least. some lies but it breaks my heart to claim it and maybe I've been socialized to minimize the pain you feel then just reframe it but I'm wondering wondering how can I be a solution right now whatever I
thinking that we're going through like the five stages of grief with this, with this pandemic. Uh, first was denial. Anybody here denial? <laughs> Yeah, you know, oh, we'll get this down pat in like six weeks. Not so much. It's still going on, isn't it? And now there seems to be a lot of anger going on. So um, hopefully at some point that will come to acceptance. We're certainly working on it um, in this center of, of helping people express their feelings, but also move to a higher level of consciousness, a higher vibration that actually creates the reality that we really want, that we really want not only for ourselves, but for all beings everywhere. And so today I'm talking about that sort of abstractly um, because one of, the, one of the challenges that we have as human beings is that we identify with things that do not serve us. We over-identify with things do not, that do not serve our spiritual side. So the talk this morning is a case of mistaken identity. A case of mistaken identity. I'm not sure where that phrase is from, but it's very familiar. Uh, it's probably from some cop show or something that I, that I watch. But, um, you know, when I think of mistaken identity, I, my mind automatically flashed back to this essay that I read probably like 10 years ago. It's an essay by David Sedaris, who is a, a uh, humorist. He's a comedic writer. Very, very funny. He writes a lot about growing up gay in North Carolina, which just... I love it because I lived in North Carolina for such a long time, and, I j and, and it was in the 60s, too. So it was, it was a very different place back then. Um, but anyway, in this particular essay, he writes about how his father accused the whole family of stealing something from the father's drawer. It was a bunch of uh, coins. And um, when David decided to figure out who had done that, and so, because the family was watching that old TV show from the 60s, remember The Fugitive with David Jansen? And the, in the beginning, there's this big monologue in the beginning about David Jansen's fate, that he, he watched somebody murder his wife, or his, his wife got murdered and a one-armed man was running from the scene and, and he had to catch him. And he escaped from the train on the way to death row and he changed his identity. He changed his identity. And David Sadara said that his memory of, of uh, Richard Kimball changing his identity was a, a quick shot of a, of a bottle of shoe polish on the sink. And so David, it's not really shoe polish. I looked at the opening, and it's actually hair dye. But anyway, David Sedaris thought it was shoe polish. And he decided that he was going to change his identity and spy on the person that has taken his father's coins because the whole family was in trouble. So he got shoe polish and he put it all over his hair. <laughs> and he said it was like a shoe polish helmet and, and how, you know, Richard Kimball's hair like flows in the breeze. David's hair wasn't going anywhere. But <laughs> anyway, he climbed into his father's closet that had sort of like these um, like slats that you could look through and he watched and he spied to see who was going through his father's drawers. Well, it was pretty much the whole family. But um, <laughs> in the end, he discovered that his mother had, had done it, and I think she ultimately confessed. This is after, you know, an hour of being in the, uh, in the closet with his shoe polish on his head. He said he was, he was practically passing out from the fumes. <laughs> And then he got out of the closet, went about his life, washed off the shoe polish, and his father was happy until he went into his closet and saw black stains all over his Dacron polyester leisure suits. <laughs> no doubt about who did that, right? <laughs> Anyway, what I love about that story is that to me, everything seems like a metaphor, and that story is no exception. It seems like a metaphor of how, you know, we are the divine. We are everything that Eckhart Tolle said. We are the beingness. We are the I am. We are not I am this, I am that. We just are I am. And yet, we, we pile a bunch of stuff on ourselves, uh, shoe polish, metaphorical shoe polish, which might be stories or limitations like Bill talked about in his message, and, and we, we throw ourselves in a closet, you know, and I think Jesus said it really well. Jesus? Hello. Jesus said it really well when he said, don't hide your light under a bushel. That means don't hide your I am presence under a bushel. Let it shine. Let it come forth. But the thing is, is that when we have these identities that we impose upon ourselves, not only do we, do we impose these identities on ourselves, is that we believe them. 
we identify with them. And again, as the reading from Eckhart Tolle said, Tolle rather, the reading from Eckhart Tolle said is that to identify means to make the same. So we think, I am that. I am my stories. I am my limitations. I am my frailties. I am my dilemmas. I am my problems. And we think that about the world too. We project that outward. You are all of the things that I just said and so much more. We do this all the time. So this message this morning is about providing an alternative to that type of consciousness. We, this type of consciousness is not mandatory. We are not saddled with it. We, we pick it up just through race consciousness and we hold on to it, but we can let it go. We can let it go at any time simply by learning to refrain from over-identifying <laughs> with the identities that we assume, and at some point, perhaps not even assuming any other identity than I am. So I hope you're with me on this, because imagine the world if we all did that, how beautiful that would be. I want to talk a little bit about God. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> so, I know that we have some newer folks probably watching on the live stream, and in this center, we, we, we teach that God is not a person. It is more of a presence, and even more so, it is a principle. That God is the energy of love, and that God is the energy of science. And that God, that everything is love, and that God is this beautiful energy that infuses everything, that, that life was created out of God. God created life out of itself. I like it when the non-dualists refer to God as consciousness or awareness, because awareness and consciousness seems something more personal and something that is perhaps more relatable. We do get stuck in the understanding that awareness is everything, that everything emerges out of awareness, but at least calling it awareness or absolute reality or consciousness helps us get a start on that, helps us get a handle on that. When I uh, want to learn more about non-duality, I have a number of teachers that I turn to, including Ernest Holmes, the founder of this religion, but, but uh, yesterday I decided to listen to a podcast, or a video rather, a YouTube, about, uh, from Rupert Spira about identity. And he phrased it in a way that was slightly different than, than I would have normally thought, so I'm actually going to read kind of the, the highlights of what he said. He said that awareness, in terms of identity, the true identity of everything is awareness. Awareness is the identity of everything. And remember that awareness, or sorry, remember identity means the same or identical to. So a horse, a butterfly, a wave in the ocean, a, a, a plant in the garden, a human, we all are made out of the same basic non-material material. material. Mm. And <laughs> what we do as humans is that we tend to make identity exclusive. This is me, that is you. This is me, that is a horse. This is me, that is a door or a building. We tend to make identity exclusive. However, awareness is always one with the totality of experience and being. Awareness is always one with the totality of experience and being. That means that I am, you are, is always one with the totality of experience and being. And if we really believe that, if we really take that in, if we continue to remind ourselves of that truth, then we will start living like that truth is true, because it is true. And how wonderful life is when we start to rec recognize that identity is the same, is, is all of experience and all of being, that we are the I am and so is everything else. Can you feel that with me? Can you feel that that's a good thing? That's exciting? Thank you, Ray and Lori. That's awesome. Thank you, everybody else, too. It's Wonderful to think of ourselves as the I am presence. It's both humbling and enlarging at the same time, which to me is a sign that we're on the right track when you feel humbled by it and also enlarged by it. 
The question is, though, in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, we, we often are caught up in the thinking of the world or the thinking of our families or the thinking of the voices in our heads. How do we, how do we move past that tendency to identify with something small when instead we can identify with all that is? Here's another metaphor. It's a little strange at first, but work with me. We'll get there, okay? I'm going to need the basket of wisdom in just a moment, so prepare yourself. The basket of, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I put Facebook posts of questions on Facebook, and I ask people to answer questions. And one of the first questions I asked yesterday was, what kind of lunchbox did you have as a child? Oh my gosh, I was shocked at how that blew up. Everybody wanted to tell me about their lunchbox or their non-lunchbox. It, it was beautiful. Everybody wanted to engage. Maybe it's like a cast back to a more innocent time when we were carrying lunchboxes and not worrying about this stupid pandemic, you know? That, <laughs> that, that back when things were a lot simpler when we were younger. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out some, um, some responses of the types of lunchboxes that we have. And now it is time for the basket of wisdom to make its appearance on stage. If you could sing the theme to Joe at home, that would be great. Dun, 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 dun. Thank you. Oops, one fell on the ground, three fell on the ground. Okay, all right, here we go. Yeah, good job, Chris, thank you. Thank you, okay, here we go. All right, I love spraying stuff, you have no idea. Let's see, I don't know if the blue ones are the, um, are the first question or the second ones. Okay, so I'm gonna pick out three lunch boxes. One, two, and three. And I'll put these over here for now. Okay, three lunch boxes. Karen, brown paper bag. <laughs> Chip, Tom Corbett, space cadet. <laughs> now, space cadet means like a person who goes into space, right? It's not just like somebody like, oh my God, I'm so spacey, right? <laughs> I'm thinking that's, <laughs> that's what that is, okay. And then we have another brown paper bag. I need to pick another one. That was Barb's brown paper bag. I'm gonna pick another one. And then I'll tell you who the all-time winner of lunchboxes was. Dina had a vinyl flowered lunchbox with a long strap. <laughs> is that not sassy or what? The, <laughs> the, biggest, the biggest occupant of lunchboxes was Scooby-Doo. We got more Scooby-Doo's than anybody else. Mine was Zorro, you know, I, yeah, see, was, was Zorro your first crush too? Yeah, he's the first bad boy that I fell in love with and that's been a pattern like my whole life, hello. So, <laughs> sorry, so, <laughs> anyway. So, I asked about the lunchbox because it's a container for something, just like, just like we are the container for something. And, um, you know, lunchboxes can have a lot of um, stuff attached to them. Like, people were saying that they were teased about their lunchboxes. They just had Tupperware, they were teased about their lunchbox. We were also teased about the content content of our lunchbox or devastated by the content of our lunchbox. If you didn't have something that was good to trade, that wasn't so good. Uh, somebody said they had a stinky peanut butter sandwich and a stinky banana, not so good. I remember the, the, the fatal day when my mother sent me a sardine sandwich to lunch. <laughs> I'd never even seen a sardine. I'm like, what are these fish doing on this bread? What do I do with this? <laughs> it was crazy. And I didn't eat it because I was so sca a little scared of it. <laughs> so. <laughs> but anyway, my point is, is that if, if we look deeper, we see deeper, if we look deeper, let's say it's, most people had sandwiches in their lunchbox, right? Let's say we're just looking at a piece of bread that's a sandwich. So it's a piece of bread, but is it really a piece of bread? Is it not really something that's in infinite? We identify a piece of bread as this is a piece of bread. This is its limitations. It's a piece of bread. You can only do certain things with it, but a piece of bread is also the sunshine, and it's also the wheat that was grown, and it's the soil, the soil that I told you about a couple of weeks ago, that in one teaspoon of soil, there are more microorganisms than there are people on Earth, and all of that conspired together to create this plant that created bread. It is the hands that, that managed the, the seeds or put them in the ground or drove the tractor or the thresher or whatever, however it is you harvest wheat. 
It is the people that, that baked it. It is the other ingredients in the bread. It, and we could go on and on and on and on to the cellular level to know that the bread is of the earth and that because it's of the earth, it is of the divine. And every single thing that we find in our lunchbox or in anything else or inside of ourselves, if we choose to see deeper, then we can release our identification with it or our identification of it as something mundane and something plain and recognize that it is truly divine. Do you feel that about the bread? That bread is, is not what we thought it was? Bread is awesome. Bread is incredible. Like I, like I said, it's the sunlight and the rain and the soil. How beautiful is that? And as we get really good about doing that about the things in our lives, we can start seeing deeper into our own hearts. This thing, this thing that I've been struggling with, what is the deeper view of this? What is the deeper view of my fear in this situation? You know, what is the deeper view of this virus? Is it just a, a virus that is, that is creating some very strange changes in our lives? Or is it something else? Is it something to wake us up to a greater reality? Is the virus part of the divine? You know, I wrote a piece the other day about wearing masks, about how wearing masks can be seen as a limitation, but we do it, of course, to protect ourselves and to protect others. My objection to wearing masks is not about having to wear one or not being able to breathe, like I hear from some folks. It's more about that people can't know that I like them. You know, when I'm in the, in the grocery store, I want people to know that I'm happy with them and that, I've, that I'm, I'm with them. And so because of the mass, because of the constraint, I started getting more creative in my approach to people and started starting conversations, conversations about all kinds of things, conversations about eyelashes. You know, there's a woman in Vons who has these amazing eyelashes, and I asked her, how do you do that? Because I'm getting better because of her, but this one is still trying to get away. I can feel it right now. <laughs> it's liable to drop off and land on the floor like some kind of a bug. So... <laughs> So you see that we, we tend to over-identify with limitations, whether they're personal limitations or the limitations that seem to be around us. But beyond the limitations, if we're willing to see deeper and say, you know, this limitation is really creativity in disguise. How can I do things differently? That's right. And then that changes everything. Because I guarantee that if we ask questions like that, rather than just identifying with it and going down our path of identity, if we step back from the identity and see something a little bit differently and ask to see it differently, even if we don't know the answer, if we ask to see it deeper, something will be provided for us. We don't necessarily know what it is. It may not make any sense, but I, I suggest asking and doing and living like the truth of our asking is true. The other thing um, that I think helps us release our identification, I just said it a moment ago, it's seeing deeper, but it's also seeing broader, stepping back, stepping back. I was uh, on a call the other day, a, a book club that I, that I do with people from all over the world, and we were, we were actually reading the Eckhart Tolle, Tolle book that uh, Hugh quoted, uh, A New Earth. And um, one of the women, I don't remember which one, talked about how she had this dream where she was in an apartment building and then she went outside, and the whole front of the apartment building was transparent. So she thought it was just her and her apartment, but when she saw the apartment, that there was all this activity going on in every single apartment. And she said, the reality in 12B is just as real as the reality in 14C. But when we're in 14C, we don't even think about 12B. But if we step back, if we step back, we can see that there are all of these realities and really, the choice is ours. If we are in a, in a little room, um, if we're in a little room, in my father's house, there are many mansions, right? Did I get that right? Okay. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If we're in, a, in one particular mansion that is not providing us with productive ideas or creativity or love or whatever it is we need to do to bless ourselves and to bless others, we can just change rooms because the other rooms are there even if we don't see it. But in the, in the dream, it took her stepping outside, stepping outside of ourselves, stepping back and looking for the transparency and seeing what could be seen when she changed her vision just a little bit. So that's an option for us as well, to do that. 
Whatever that means for you metaphorically, look at a place where you're looking at something too closely, over-identifying with it, and say, what happens if I step back and give this a broader view, a deeper view, a broader view and a deeper view? And same thing, we can ask spirit, spirit, God, beloved, please give me a broader view of this situation, right? Same thing, you know, what I talked before about COVID, about politics, about everything that's going on. If we step back in a broader view, maybe it makes a little bit more sense when we do that. Maybe there's a little bit more forgiveness. Maybe there's a little bit more grace that is trying to emerge. And yet if we're pounding on it and identifying and identifying others with right and wrong, it's not Rumi's field. We've got to move past the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing and have that broader view that Rumi's field becomes a meadow. Rumi's field becomes a football field. Rumi's field becomes 10 football fields all strewn, strewn together. Rumi's field is the earth and Rumi's field is the universe. If we can do that, there's great hope for all of us both individually and collectively. The last thing I want to say about, um, about identification and over-identifying, perhaps, is to surrender everything. <laughs> we see deeply, we see broadly, and we surrender everything. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to give up all your stuff I know that when I talk with this about dog lovers, they say, do I have to give up my dog? And I say, absolutely not. That would be wrong. No. <laughs> Just means surrender. Surrender your ideas. Surrender your grasping. Surrender your clinging. I asked, that was my second question on Facebook. I'm going to read some responses in just a minute. I asked, what are you clinging to? It was interesting because I was expecting a very different type of response. I thought people would be like me, of course, because I was saying, well, I, I, actually not so much right now, but I was clinging to sugar. I was clinging to various other addictive activities like doing um, like computer games. I was clinging to mm, the clinging to, to the need to know how this is all going to turn out. That did not serve me very well. <laughs> as soon as I moved into acceptance, things got better. But I got some sort of different responses that puzzled me a bit. So I'm going to see. Maybe I'll get one of those. Maybe I won't. Let's see. I'm going to pull out three responses. Hmm. OK. Three responses from the basket of wisdom. Gina is clinging to her friends. Stephanie is clinging to hope. Kathy, oh, we're twins. She's <laughs> clinging to having to know all the answers. <laughs> the biggest, like Scooby-Doo, was the most popular answer on the lunchbox question. Hope was the biggest, the most popular response on what are you clinging to. And I said to myself, wow, are you going to go into church on Sunday and tell people that they shouldn't cling to hope? Isn't that like the opposite? Like we're supposed to have hope, we're supposed to have faith, we're supposed to trust in God and tether our camel? And I was really puzzled about this. I went to bed puzzled about what I was going to say. But I do know, I've learned from some of my Buddhist friends, that the object that we're clinging to is not as important as the clinging itself. The clinging itself is what gets us in trouble. And if we are clinging to something with white knuckles, chances are we're holding, we're holding on to it too tightly and we're resisting anything else. We're resisting it going away. And that often creates issues with our lives and with our identity, and we don't have the same resonance and connection with the I am presence that we do when we're, when we're clinging to something. But rather than tell people to give up hope, <laughs> to stop clinging to hope. I went to bed, like I said, puzzled, and I woke up in the middle of the night, as I often do, and it was dark, and I, had, I, I just had this download of what I wanted to say, and I wrote it in the dark. <laughs> could barely read it in the morning, but I'm going to read it to you <laughs> now because I transcribed it. Okay, so it says, don't let go of hope. Become hope. 
allow both hope and hopelessness and rest in the tension of opposites without clinging or resisting either one. Your equanimity, your ability to tolerate paradox will allow you to rise out of the opposites and be the source of all things. This is where your hope abides. This is true hope, the hope beyond hope. And the good news is, the good news is for all of us is that we are already that. All it takes is a release of mistaken identity. So take off the shoe polish, come out of the closet, <laughs> and be who you really are. You are the I am presence, living and expressing as you. And so it is. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks. I hope you all are clapping at home because, you know, I <laughs> God's watching. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Chris, I guess it's time to pray. Yes, it's time to do the prayer. Uh, is anybody else experiencing COVID amnesia? I am. I don't, I mean, I don't have it, but just, I don't have, yeah, I don't have the virus, but I think just because of the way things are, I can't remember anything these days. <laughs> but I'm not going to identify with that. So I'm going to pray right now, and Chris is going to help me. So turning within, I just breathe, and I know, and I trust that there is this power, this I am, this awareness, this awareness that is greater than any earthly thing, but it is all earthly things, that it is beyond my capacity to describe it, but it still is. And we know this in our bodies, we know it in our feelings, we know it in our thoughts, we know it in our highest wisdom, that this life that is God is perfect, inclusive of everything, it excludes nothing, and that it simply is. It includes all of us here praying together today, it includes me, it includes every single person here in the sanctuary, it includes the folks at home, it includes the entire earth. How wonderful to know that it's not only that we are one with that, we are that. We are the I am. We are awareness manifesting in an individualized form here to express the grace and the goodness of the I am to the best of our possible ability. And so today, let us collectively identify with that, with that consciousness, that I am the I am. If you want to say that after me at home, I am the I am or here, <laughs> I am the I am. There you go, there you go, perfect. Yes, and so we are that. And then we just allow that consciousness to, to fill us and to move us and to expand our hearts and to expand our beings so that we can embrace the entire world, so that we no, no longer need to look for the, for the be, for the specks in other people's eyes, and we are able to take out the log of, of identification from our own eyes and open up to receive all of the goodness that that brings. Because the only thing that's standing in the way of our goodness is ourselves. And how wonderful it is to know that and to release that and to let it go and to finally be available, to be that balloon that soars upwards, like Bill said in his, in his children's message. And so I'm just so grateful, so grateful for this availability, so grateful for this spiritual truth, for this message, for this, this music, for this whole service that has been just put together by humans, but also in a conspiracy with the, the divine. Awareness showing up here as our center, growing it, evolving it, pouring forth through each of us as we do the good work of love here in the world. I love this teaching. I love the way it transforms us. I love all paths to God. Churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, fundamentalists, atheists, agnostics, all the people I haven't mentioned. I love it all because all is love. And with a heart that is so filled with loving kindness and so filled with grace and trust, I simply release these words into the divine mystery and together we say, and so it is. Thank you. Okay. So good morning again, good morning again. That was a, wow, that was a wonderful talk. I'm just swimming in that. This is wonderful stuff. And um, this song is sung from the perspective of the living one itself, looking at its creation and saying, in essence, there I am. 
There I am, there I am. This song is called The One Badum. 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 One Badum. This is going to drive me crazy if I don't just adjust. Okay. More the story than the storybook. Bottom, bottom. More the love than the loving look. Bottom, bottom. I'm the eye behind the sky where kites and strings and kind birds fly. Bottom, 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 bottom. In the whisper trees of forest green. Bottom, bottom. In the desert flower unfolding, bottom, bottom. On the dark and silent soil sleep, from seed emerging, reaching deep, bottom, 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 bottom. I am the I am the one, the one. I am the I am. In the sweetness of your lover's kiss, bottom, bottom. When they say I love you more than this, bottom, bottom. I'm the autumn, I'm the spring, the birds and bees and songs they sing, bottom, 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 bottom. so much. So um, again, after the service, please feel free to call on a practitioner in the Zoom call. The link should be in the, f in the Facebook feed by now, and I know that they would love to pray with you. And if, you ha if you've nev never done it before, try it, because it's really wonderful. You feel so loved and so nurtured, and you can pray for anything you want, okay? So um, I think we're good to go. Uh, let us go ahead, and I'll do the closing prayer, and then um, we'll 
Yeah, we don't sing anymore. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Not for now. Not for now. That's coming back. Okay. All right. So we turn within and trust to know that there truly is that one perfect life. And we trust that that life has blessed us here in this sacred time together. That in that life that is, that is love, that is God, that is the absolute awareness, that there is no such thing as distance. And that's when, what's near is far and what's far is near. Because there, there is no up in infinity, there is no down in infinity, there is no distance in infinity. It all just is. And so I know that we are, we are ising all together today here in this sacred service. And so let us take this, this time together and use it to change our hearts and change the heart of the world, to be more open to love and to be givers and receivers of great love. I know that we are a center of love, that we are love, that we share love, and we serve love, and we live like that truth is true, always. And so with a heart that is so grateful, I say thank you, Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for everyone who participated. And I release these words into the divine mystery. And together we say, and so it is. <laughs>